Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you a diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for their craft. And whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer to the work, we're confident that you'll find something to inspire and captivate you in each and every one of our interviews. So join us as we journey across borders and cultures, discovering new and exciting talents and celebrating the power of art and entertainment, what brings people together. They are currently on a Western Canadian tour swing of their When the Devil Drives tour and making a pit stop here in Calgary at Dickens on Wednesday, June 14th. Econoline Crush's new single, No Quitter, is now out, and today we are honored to chat with the band's lead singer, Trevor Hurst. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Trevor, I, okay. I'm going to be up front right here, right now. I'm going to try and get through these questions about No Quitter because this song has spoken to me in more ways than you can imagine. As someone who's gone through some uh, big health challenges over the last three years, there's days where you feel like you want to give up. But this song really resonates with me when I started listening to it on repeat as of last week. For you, why was it important for you to release this song, No Quitter? Well, it's interesting because for two reasons. I mean, the title, obviously, the theme of the song works very, very well with what's happened in our lives. Um, and there's been a number of things. Um, also, on the record, in a way, the sound of the song, although reminiscent of our past work, is kind of an outlier. Um, and I don't know what it is about those songs on records, but I like to lead with something kind of, different so that maybe it draws in a little bit more attention creates some criticisms whatever and then the next song and you know maybe ties things together i think as the body of work the record makes sense and the song fits in perfectly as to why this song was important um you know it was written prior to the passing of our guitar player ziggy um so it really wasn't totally connected to that situation but it was connected to the fact that being an artist, whether you're painting or doing whatever, that it comes with a lot of challenges. A lot of people don't necessarily understand sometimes the artist's mentality or the need for artists to create. And uh, and then the need to just sort of persevere through everyday life. And, and if you've lived any amount of time on earth, you've had to go through some trials and tribulations. And this is... Uh, this is a song to kind of honor that effort and to say, you know, as a band and as people and as fans, we're not quitting. Does it speak more prominently now in 2023 with everything that's going on? I know you are a big advocate for mental health and addiction, and this song sort of does speak to that desire to not give up on yourself and not uh, just throw in the chips but continue fighting and at the end of the day while it may seem like the dark is around you you can't quit and you have to continually move on absolutely i think a lot, like and, and this is interesting too because this was written during the pandemic um so there was a lot of unknowns as to how that was going to end how we were going to come out of it and and then a lot of people, you know, were looking at concerts and things and wondering if they were ever going to be a thing again. And it was very, you know, it's just different times. And I felt like, you know, it's it's just so important kind of like to just understand that, you, you know, you only have one go round in this life and you've got to make every day count. And it's just so important, I think, with all those burdens that people face to have some sort of anthem or kind of a thing to... I don't know what we call this song, sort of a rebellious little ditty <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that, that that speaks to that, you know? You you are on your Western tour right now. You're going to be making a stop here in Calgary. Um, for you to, to sort of play devil's advocate here, but how does it feel not to quit, to continue doing what you enjoy, to continue pushing forward and creating the music that you are so passionate about, but you also love and perform in front of groups of people who just love to feel your energy while you're in front of people. Well, it's, it's amazing. And you know, there in your 
career as a musician, sometimes there's ebbs and flows and different types of venues. And I really, really love doing kind of like, it's almost like if you're a politician, it's a door to door campaign. When we go into these clubs, you know, we're like, we're like up close and personal. I basically talk to almost everybody in the club by the end of the night, um, you know, signing stuff at the merch table and uh, just hanging out. I think it's so important for us as musicians to hear the stories of what our music has meant to different individuals. Like I get told some pretty interesting stories every night and um, it helps to kind of recharge the batteries. So every one of these shows to me personally is a kind of like a, like a little battery stop or a charging station, because after you play the show, you're just like, you're even more inspired to carry on. And I think that's, that's the beauty of, of art when, and being able to do it with rock and roll is that you do get to hear from your fans. You do interact with them whether on social media or whatever, but in person at these gigs, it's way, way better. Was it challenging for you as an artist to live through the pandemic? Because I, I've spoken to many different artists, whether they be jazz singers to rock and roll to just, just a, a, an acoustic guitar. Um, and the pandemic really took a toll on them, whether it be their mental health or whether it be just their desire to continue moving forward. For you, the last three years, while we are relatively out of the pandemic, people are still getting sick. But for you, what was it like to go through the last three years? Well, a couple of things like that. The, the pandemic was was bizarre because it was just so divisive in a lot of ways a lot of things just didn't make sense to me why people were arguing and fighting over elements of the pandemic there was uh we were trying to get music you know i was recording in kitchener and living in in, in manitoba and i would have to quarantine in 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 you know when i landed came back from ontario for like i think it was 10 days and that's the most bizarre thing you know you're left to you by yourself you can't go anywhere you're not supposed to do anything that was bizarre um but it must feel nice to be back out on the road now it must feel like there's like a, oh. a little jump in your step getting out there and meeting with the people who stuck with you during the pandemic <laughs> absolutely and you know what was weird okay so there was a lot of pressure to do these kind of like online shows you know we'll charge you five cents or whatever you can come watch this play and there's so much to be said for the pheromones and the heat and the sort of the hot, sweaty mess that is a crowd. I don't know that I could do the same kind of thing without the audience there. I'm sure, but I, I pushed back hard on doing it. I didn't feel like that was an appropriate avenue or venue for a Conline Crush. Now, maybe in the future, somebody can convince me otherwise. But at that time, I was like, I don't really see this working. I feel like we need to be in a hot, sweaty room. We need to have a lot of, you know, noises. We just, it's just got to be that rock and roll atmosphere. It's so important. Like it, it's, we feed off it, you know, it, it brings it, the, the audience is a big part of the show. And if they're on a screen, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's true. And I can imagine it's tough being an artist, but it does give uh, people like myself the ability to sit down with you and chat about uh, your uh, music, but also your career. But I want to talk about the new album. This uh, No Quitter is all going to be off the new album. And this is your, this is e e Econoline's uh, Crush's first uh, full length album in almost a decade. Why now? What what happened now? Was it the pandemic that was able to sort of lock you down and write this new album? Or has this been a long time coming? It's been a long time coming, actually. And, you know, we had, you know, leaps. We'd start, we'd get going, starts and stops, starts and stops. We probably five or six years ago, we went down to Ashland, Oregon and started working with Sylvia Massey. And the sessions went well, but they didn't yield what I felt would be, you know, what we should put out. Elements of that session and Sylvia's vocals and per, some of her um, production ideas did, you know, move into this record and uh, some of Ziggy's playing that was down there became part of the record. But um, yeah, we just had these starts and stops and then, and then all of a sudden the pandemic comes in and it's just like, holy cow. 
And I think that's why No Quitter kind of fits too, because it was like, you know, you easily could have said, you know what, there's just too many hurdles. There's too many roadblocks. There's too many things in the way that, you know, the universe is telling you to stop. And uh, I refuse to believe that. And I, and, and when Ziggy and I, when Ziggy was with us, you know, we would talk about this and I said, what else are we going to do, man? Like, I mean, I've worked as a psychiatric nurse in the First Nation, but I still felt like, and then I read this really good quote from from um, a book called the, the War on Art, and i sorry, I can't remember the author, but he basically was saying, you know, if you've been given a gift, if you've been given a um, some sort of skill, and, and this skill brings joy to others, you know, it's it's kind of like, it's disrespectful not to share it. And the idea, we don't have to change the world with our music. We don't have to change the world with our art. All we have to do is move the, the goal, the stick, or whatever you want to call it, just one millimeter closer to the source, closer to source. You do that, and everybody else does that, and we'll get there. So it that whole idea kind of took a little, like, I don't know why we think we've got to, you know, solve every problem sometimes as artists. And I realized, you know, just... Do your little part, do your bit, go out there, make music. And I love creating in the studio so much. So um, I, yeah, I couldn't give this up. I mean, they're going to have to like, I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah, I hope to be doing it just like Mick Jagger and Heath Richards going on and on and on and on, you know? You talk about how music can speak to people, how art can speak to people. For you, what does it mean as an artist that after this long a time, people are still coming to your show, still enjoying your music, still wanting to enjoy new stuff that you put out? Because I can imagine while some artists get a big head when they put out a, a song or get a big uh, ego when things come along, for you, what does it mean when people actually come up to you and say that their your music has spoken to them and helped them through rough times or helped them through difficult situations? I'm incredibly grateful. Um, that's the only really... It's the it's the it, it, it's the only word I could come up with that, that fits. It's like this gratitude, this this great sense of like, I am so grateful that I had an opportunity to affect change, and that my ideas or whatever I heard in my head then became something that they used as a catalyst to change or as a catalyst to have a good time or whatever it was. Yeah, I mean it's everything I think in a lot of ways. And sometimes I think artists, like some artists, maybe they get too insulated, I don't know, and they don't get to actually have real conversations. I've had people, I've held people while they cried on this tour already. And that is a beautiful thing. It's it's a privilege to have had some impact on somebody's life. It's not like, you know, it's not an ego thing about saying, yeah, I make the songs, make the whole world sing. No, it is like a privilege. It's some little lines, some little part connected. And that you were able to, for a second, provide some some source of some sort of relief. So, what can people expect to hear on Wednesday night when you're here in Calgary at uh, Dickens on the 14th? Is it some of the old stuff, some of the new stuff that hasn't been released yet on the new uh, album? What can people expect to hear? A big racket. No, uh... <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> no, it, it will be all all parts of the career there's this this is two three three songs from the record in the set the new record uh include with including no quitter uh stuff from purge stuff from affliction stuff from the people have spoken stuff from ignite um yeah there's there's music from every every part of our career and uh yeah and that it, it's it's kind of cool too when you play all the songs together from that period of time it's just it's interesting because it kind of gives you an insight into your own mental health and well-being and inspirations. And I can, you know, relate to the songs in a different way now than I did when I wrote them, maybe. And that's really interesting, too, you know. Are you excited to be back in Calgary? I am, actually. I really am. Um, I think about a lot of different shows playing with Kiss. You know, it's really funny. Uh, we were opening for Kiss. And uh, CJ 
in, in that saddle on it. And CJ wanted um you to come out to the van, you know, do a quick interview before before we play, I think it was before we played, yeah. And so there was a lineup of people waiting to get into the uh, into the arena. And I had some outfit on. I can't remember what I was wearing, but this was such a wicked burn. I couldn't believe it. But as I'm walking to the CJ van, this guy yells, hey, buddy, buddy, you too was last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, Calgary is a fun town. It is a it is it is a different city than uh, any of the other cities in Canada. And yeah, are, are you surprised that the rock and roll uh, music is uh, so prominent here in Calgary? Because traditionally, it's known as the country town, Calgary Stampede. But it seems like more and more country, uh, more and more rock and roll bands, and yourself included, are coming here and seeing the passion that our our city has for not just country, but for all types of genres. Yeah, like I I find that too. It's, it is interesting because, like, I, when it, we used to, do, when we were touring in the states, we could go to Nashville, and uh, and I also went down to Nashville to work on some music, and and the music scene there, you go, okay, well, Nashville country, well, no, Nashville's hip hop, Nashville's rock and roll. When we played shows there with Buck Cherry, it was sold out and crazy. Um, Calgary is kind of a same sort of thing. I think, you know, good music is good music, and I think with the Stampede and some of the the events that Calgary has where you bring in a multitude of genres, people get exposed to music. Maybe they didn't think they'd like, or maybe they just stumble upon it. And uh, I don't know, but it seems like it, since the beginning, like since we played the Republic and all these different clubs in Calgary, um, it's always been a great reception. And it's always been, you know, a city that you could count on for, a, you know, a really good kind of boisterous audience. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's cool. That's a really neat thing. But you're not just making a stop here in Calgary and on your Alberta swing, you're making a stop in Red Deer on Tuesday, the 13th. So tomorrow night yeah. uh, on uh, the 15th, Thursday, you're up at the city of the province's capital of Edmonton at the starlight room. And then white court in party in the park uh, on Friday, uh, Alberta is being nice to you, I guess. <laughs> they are. And, and you know, my, I have, um, my my cousins have a band called Bad Communicators, and they're going to be on two of the shows, the one in Edmonton and the one in Red Deer. And uh, that, for me, is so special because, uh, you know, during the my cousin and, and her husband, one of their first dates, or I think it was their first date, was Edge Fest seeing a Conline Crush play. And now his son is in a band with him and my cousin and they, they, they make rock and roll. And I just love it. I mean, even if I had, even if it wasn't that much of an influence, just the tiniest little bit, Hey, I, I, I'll take it. I mean, and then I get to hang out with my cousins two nights and watch them play and have fun. And believe me, they have fun when they play their, their brand of rock and roll is a lot of, a lot of fun. Trevor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for 20 minutes and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Uh, to my listeners and to my viewers, I just want to remind uh, a link to the uh, tickets if you still want to go to the Calgary, to the White Court, if you're going to be in Red Deer, to the tickets there, or even the Edmonton show are in the show notes. So highly recommend that you get it because I'm going to be buying a ticket to go see uh, Econoline uh, Crush in the Calgary when they're here on Wednesday. So come out and see them with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yes be sure to come by and talk to me after the show when i'm getting sweaty and and we will uh, we'll have a little chat but it's a pleasure always to talk to you and i hope uh i hope you have fun when you come out <laughs> we certainly will thank you so much until then just remind everyone just keep talking amen, amen.